morning, everybody. Um, I'm Jim Hall. I'm here with my colleague, Betty Dahl, here in the front row. We're here from Hewlett Packard Enterprise to tell you about our proposal for a new Linux Gen Z subsystem. Here's what we're going to talk about today, starting with an introduction to Gen Z, because my assumption is that many of you don't even know what Gen Z is or how it works or anything. So we're going to do a really brief uh, discussion of what you need to know so that you can understand what the rest of our presentation is about. So Gen Z is an open, new interconnect protocol. Uh, first of all, it's a consortium with broad industry support. There's over 70 members in the consortium right now, uh, ranging from system designers to memory device designers to switch companies to software people, um, but mostly hardware. And there's a few of us thinking about software here. Um, it's a whole family of specifications. There's a core spec, which gives you the basics of the protocol and uh, how control space works and some few things that we'll talk about later. There's physical specifications. There's mechanical specifications that talk about form factors for putting these things into boxes, connectors, uh, and a software and management spec as well. Uh, it's most important parameter probably is that uh, Gen Z is a memory semantic fabric. And by memory semantic, I mean that you can have devices out on the other side of the fabric and in your CPU under the control of a Linux OS, you can do an M map of a region of memory out there and do direct load stores to that. So you don't have to just do RDMA messaging or Ethernet packets or anything. You can do load stores to those devices out there. And Gen Z can scale from anywhere from two to 256 million components on that fabric, uh, which is, you know, a pretty big number. And um, Gen Z is a Phi independent protocol in the sense that there's a Phi independence layer and you can run it against uh, any number of Phi's, uh, depending on what kind of latency, bandwidth, and reach that you need. Uh, the three Phi's that are specified right now include a uh, PCI Phi at 32 gigabytes, uh, gigatransfers per second, and uh, two different 802.3 Phi's at 25 and 50 gigabits. And the reason there are these different Phi's is that, you know, PCI Phi's can go about this far, and copper uh, Ethernet Phi's can go about this far, and if you want to go further than that, like across a row of data center boxes or an entire data center, then you probably need to do an optical phi, and there'll be some of those specified in Gen Z as well. Uh, Gen Z can support a completely unmodified OS by hiding all of the complication of the fabric management and making the devices appear like PCI devices in firmware. But that's not what we're here to talk about. <laughs> we're here to talk about having Linux be a full player. Um, and uh, we'll talk a little bit uh, later about why we think that's necessary and that just hiding it in uh, firmware is not a good idea. So in this picture, we have two different example fabrics. The one on the left is a pretty basic fabric two machines, each with a CPU and memory, connected over some coherent native interconnect to between that CPU and a bridge, which is the name Gen Z gives to the device that connects from a CPU out onto the Gen Z fabric, and then two media components in each of those servers. So there's six Gen Z components in all in that fabric on the left. Um, each component can have one or more interfaces. It's a point-to-point -point connection. If you want to fan out, then you have to have a switch, which is that uh, sort of octagonal thing in the middle there. Uh, switches can be either standalone or integrated in with pretty much any other component type uh, if you want to have switching in that component. On the right-hand side is a far more complicated fabric. Um, it's representative of what you might use in a HPC kind of environment. Uh, this is a, a two-dimensional HyperX, which means that 
Uh, each switch in the fabric is connected directly to all of the other switches in both its row and its column, um, which leads to uh, one of the prime features of a Gen Z fabric, which is that you can have multi-path. Um, you can have software set up the routing to, to go uh, between any number of those switches, uh, you know, directly two hops to get directly there or multiple hops along the way for, for a redundancy or uh, bandwidth improvements. I mentioned that there has to be management software. Um, in general, there will be multiple OS instances running on the nodes in the fabric. None of those individual uh, OS instances can assume that they own the entire fabric um, or all the components that it might find out there. Uh, furthermore, you don't have to assign complete components to any given OS instance. You could divide up those components. For example, a, a large media device can be carved up into pieces and each of those we call a resource. And those can be individually assigned to uh, particular OS instances or shared, which is one of the main uh, ideas here is that you don't have to have a, a resource assigned just to one OS, but they can be, be used by multiple ones simultaneously. Um, to make that work, the fabric manager has to have some idea about what resources should be assigned to which OS instance. So we have this thing in the management uh, subgroup called the grand plan. Um, if you do a Google search for grand plan, the first thing that comes up is uh, something from Wikipedia talking about the Sith uh, in the Star Wars universe. Yeah, so w that's why I really, I think it really is a, a grand plan in that, in that sense, exactly. Um, <laughs> let's see. Uh, fabric management can be done either in band, meaning that the fabric management traffic is going over the Gen Z fabric itself, or out of band, which would mean you'd have some uh, other set of uh, connections between those devices like Ethernet. Um, either one can be supported. And one of the main functions of this Gen Z management software is to set up the routing. Like I said before, you can have a multitude of routes and you have to decide which routes are good ones, um, which ones should be enabled, which ones should be denied because you don't want those two components to talk to each other at all. Um, and then because there's this fabric manager sitting out there and it's the only one who knows which resources should be assigned to an OS, there has to be some communication mechanism between a local management service running on each and every node that talks to that fabric manager and says, hey, which of these things that are out there that you're managing am I supposed to see? And that local management service will uh, talk to that fabric manager using a DMTF Redfish uh, interface to learn what, uh, what resources are its. We're going to drop down one little level of detail lower now and get you some very basic Gen Z concepts. So there are three basic component roles. Requesters are the things that initiate packets in order to get service from some other entity out on the fabric, which is known as a responder, which executes that packet and then sends back an acknowledgement if it needs to. Um, that acknowledgement happens both for reads and writes, so even writes are acknowledged. This is basically a reliable protocol if there are some error in the transmission on any one of those links, the hardware will retry up to some programmed limit to uh, try to make that uh, transaction happen. But uh, it could, of course, fail if that uh, happens too many times, if the link is really dead, for example. And then there are switches whose role is just to route packets from ingress interfaces to egress interfaces. And they have a big set of uh, tables each switch component that decide what routing paths are, are enabled and which ones are not. 
Every component on the fabric has a 28-bit global component ID, uh, GCID or GCID. Uh, it's assigned by management software. The first 16 of the bits of those are, are called the subnet ID, which is optional. And then there's a required 12-bit component ID. So if you want to build the small fabric, you don't have to have the full 28 bits. You can just do 12 of those. Uh, components, every component on the fabric has two separate address spaces. Uh, there's the data address space, which is up to 2 to the 64 bits, bytes in size, uh, on each and every component. And next to it is a control uh, address space, totally separate, 2 to the 52 bytes in size maximum, uh, where management software uh, will program um, various parameters into the component. A really important thing to understand is that by default, packets are completely unordered on Gen Z, which is very different than PCIe, which has a, a well-known um, ordering model. Here, they are uh, unordered by assumption. And that's for a couple of reasons. One, we showed in the previous uh, slides that multipath can happen. So every packet that comes from my requester might follow a different path to that component, and they may arrive out of order. Furthermore, there's the hardware retry mechanism, which can cause <coughs> just one packet to fail. Others succeed, and then that one is retried, and so that causes out of order as well. And finally, another big software visible difference is that coherence in this fabric is usually going to be done uh, with software. And that's because uh, hardware coherence mechanisms that we use on processors today really can't um, scale to the size fabrics we're talking about here. You would be spending all of your time doing snooping or even directory-based things that don't scale that far. So coherence in general will be software managed. Here's a picture of what control space looks like on each component. Um, every control space starts at zero, and there's a required structure at address zero called the core structure. And so that you start there. And inside that core structure, there will be a bunch of fields describing various things, including pointers to other structures, which describe more things about the component. And um, those pointers can create links, uh, link lists. So the interface structure here, for example, um, the first interface, number zero, is pointed to by the core structure, and then it points to one and on to two and n eventually. And there's a whole tree of uh, defined uh, links and uh, a known mechanism to, to follow all those pointers and find all that stuff. Uh, there's really two things in control space. One are structures, which have a fixed header in the front of them and therefore uh, can, can be self-describing. There are also tables, which are, are uh, not structures. They don't have that fixed header, and therefore you have to have special uh, algorithm to go look at other fields and other structures to figure out how big that thing is and, and what it is. I mentioned that bridges are the Gen Z device <coughs> that connects the CPU into the fabric. Here's a block diagram of an example bridge. This bridge block diagram is, is a marginally fictionalized version of a bridge that HPE has built and reported on at uh, Hot Chips a couple of weeks ago. So if you want to find out more about that bridge, you can look up that presentation. In the middle of this diagram is the CPU, which has, of course, MMUs and often IO MMUs these days. So these are standard CPUs with their local memory. And then they connect over some um, interconnect to the bridge. If you're doing the load store um, mechanism, then you'll start 
by uh, executing a load or store instruction in the CPU through the standard MMU, creating a physical address which comes out into the bridge. Now that physical address simply doesn't have enough data in it to uh, resolve into a Gen Z address because as I mentioned, every component might have a full 64-bit address of its own and physical addresses on CPUs are just not that big these days. Uh, furthermore, you need to have uh, other data to fill into the Gen Z packet, like what the global uh, destination is, and this thing called an R key, which is part of the access control mechanism. And therefore, there's an extra layer of translation called the requester's EMMU in the path, where that physical address is looked up and then turned into all those uh, additional parameters before it goes out onto the uh, Gen Z fabric. Similarly, on the way back in, uh, a component will have been addressed and routed, the packet will be routed to the correct destination, presumably if not, the responder will throw it away. But assuming it arrives, then uh, the Z address will be looked up in the responder's EMMU, along with the R key, which is compared uh, against the R key stored in the uh, ZMMU to make sure it matches, and again, if it doesn't, that will throw it away. And that will look up uh, a virtual address and paste it, which will be forwarded to an IO MMU before uh, flowing into the system memory, assuming your platform has an IO MMU. Because load store um, access probably can't get you uh, direct access to all of the fancy uh, packets uh, and uh, functionality that Gen Z has. It's often a good idea in your bridge to have uh, what's called a, a data mover, which is just a, a name for a fancy DMA engine. And uh, it gives you uh, access to packets that you can't generate with, with load store. It can also um, provide you the option to do uh, RDMA if you want to do that. Uh, similarly, on the receive side, you can have a receive data mover, which uh, can receive messages from Gen Z that are, that are uh, encapsulated Ethernet packets, for example, um, and uh, send those off into a queue, queue structure uh, in a normal kind of DMA way uh, because they're not, they're, not, well, track, they're not packets that have direct addresses. Uh, instead, they're uh, more context-based. And finally, the control space has to be directly accessible both from the local CPU and if you're doing in-band management, uh, that uh, control space has to be uh, accessible uh, from the fabric as well. And so um, the responder uh, will take control packets, which are different than data packets, and route them not through the responder's MMU, but to the uh, control space block directly. Again, this is just an example. You don't have to build your bridge like this but uh, the Gen Z subsystem needs to be able to manage uh, these resources in, in bridges. A little more about ZMMUs. <coughs> uh, the assumption uh, in the spec is that they are OS managed, so um, the OS has direct ability to write the translations into the ZMMU, which means that any OS can generate that's destined to, to any particular device out there. And so then you might ask, well, how do you deal with access control and security? And that's a whole other talk that we're not going to talk about here. Um, I think on the diagram description, I already covered most of the uh, requester uh, ZMMU items on this bullet here. Uh, I did say that responder ZMMU is data space only and not control space. And um, the Gen Z spec defines two different kinds of, of uh, ZMMU structures. The first is called a, a page table based one, which is structured much like a CPU's uh, <coughs> MMUs with multiple levels of in-memory page tables and uh, caching of those elements into the into a TLB in the in the IO or into the ZMMU. Sorry, very much like a, a CPU or IO MMU structure. But there's also another kind, which is called the page grid, which is an on-chip 
uh, only no tables in memory. And it has a fixed number of PTEs. And uh, therefore, uh, it's a very uh, limit, limited resource. And so we need to have code in the subsystem to uh, handle both of those kinds of CNN rules. All right. That covers pretty much the introduction to Gen Z that I wanted to uh, get you guys all up to speed as much as possible in the short time we have. Let's move on now to talking about the kernel subsystem itself. So why do we want to do a kernel subsystem? Well, first we want to enable native device drivers um, to control uh, IO devices or accelerators that are out there on the uh, Gen Z fabric. And that enables uh, full access of all the advanced Gen Z features. There's a whole list of them here on the slide, which we are not going to cover today due to lack of time. Um, and it also enables the, the sharing, like I mentioned before, where if you do it in firmware, then pretty much a resource assigned to a firmware and then presented to an OS as, a, as, as if it were a local device. Well, that, that OS instance is, of course, going to assume that it has full and exclusive access to that uh, device. And so if you want to do sharing, you can't do it the firmware way. You have to have an uh, OS visible knowledge about the sharing that's going on. Furthermore, we have in our design the idea that um, we're going to put Fabric Manager and those local management services that I mentioned uh, in user space. And uh, the Gen Z subsystem will be the mechanism that, that those user space processes will be uh, given access to those resources. And why are we doing this now? Well, because hardware is showing up essentially now. Here are the things we had in mind while doing the design that we had. First, uh, since this Gen Z subsystem wants to expose uh, native devices, uh, it needs to be a bus subsystem in the, in, the kernel, in the Linux kernel sense. And we have existing examples of bus subsystems like PCI and USB and Graybus. So we want to be like those uh, where we can. So that way driver writers that are used to doing drivers for those bus subsystems will, will not be too freaked out by some kind of odd design that we've done. Uh, this next one is maybe the most important of all, which is that we want policy to be in user space and just the mechanism in the kernel to the extent possible. Uh, the previous speaker was talking all about these uh, odd heuristics in the memory management system for page reclaim. We don't want to have uh, things like that that get in the way of, uh, of uh, making this work. So just let user space do it. We're going to use existing kernel services where that makes sense. And last but not least, we have to deal with the fact that if you read the core spec in Gen Z, nearly every feature in there is optional. Um, and so we have to somehow deal with uh, that uh, level of complexity where uh, we have to be able to make sure that we can build an interoperable system of, of these components where they may have chosen slightly different uh, feature sets. So here is our block diagram of what we are proposing to build. The subsystem itself is in kernel space down at the bottom. So those two green boxes, the key on the right says the green things are, are new, so it's the new stuff. It will be connected to uh, bus and DMA subsystems in the kernel um, as you might expect. Uh, we'll talk about Netlink, uh, hot plug infrastructure, and the slash sys file system uh, in a minute. Yes, Terry? Now, when you say it's the new, when you say new, it's existing new or to be built? Um, new in the subsystem or new user space components using the subsystem. So it's stuff, the code, new code that we're writing now. That's the green stuff. Okay. Yellow stuff is already in the kernel 
and blue I haven't talked about yet, but I will now. Um, so we need to have interfaces both down to bridge device drivers, which we'll be talking about a little bit more later. Uh, so that's at the bottom. Uh, each vendor supplies a, a bridge device driver that corresponds to their bridge device. And then there'll be a set of um, upward facing uh, native device drivers that provide various services like block device services or memory device services or uh, Ethernet NIC services or RDMA services to, uh, to user space. And then in the user space itself, there are two main um, components being described here. The first is the local management services block on the, on the right, not the far right just next to that. Um, and we call that LAMAS because it's the Linux local management service and you stick a couple of A's in there and you get a cool name, LAMAS. And then there's uh, a fabric manager, which we're calling Zephyr. Uh, Zephyr because besides the definition which has to do with wind, uh, there's one that has to do with fabric. So fabric manager named Zephyr. And uh, we'll talk more about those in a little while. But first, let's talk about the kernel piece of this. One thing I want to make clear is that this is very definitely a work in progress. We are not done by any means. We have some code that implements some of this stuff. Um, but we are at a good place where uh, if, if there are glaring deficiencies that you see or things that we're doing wrong, let us know now. Uh, you'll see a set of questions here in a little bit. Uh, that we have for the community to answer. And uh, hopefully we'll get some of those answers today or at the end of the talk or out in the hallway track. Okay, so the first aspect of um, getting the subsystem operational is basically that uh, we assume that a bridge device will be discovered on its native bus, say it's connected via BPCI or some PCI variant like CXL or C6 or OpenCAPI or whatever. Um, so that bridge device will be discovered in the normal way using uh, those existing subsystems. And then when it's got its device ready, uh, initialized, it will make a call uh, to Gen Z register bridge, which is the notification to the Gen Z subsystem that this isn't just some ordinary PCI device, but it wants to talk to uh, uh, Gen Z. And that'll happen you know, usually during the probe function of, of that native bridge driver. And when the subsystem finds uh, such a bridge, uh, it will make, uh, it will be presented uh, two things. One is the native device pointer uh, for that uh, device on its native bus, as well as a pointer to a structure which has got a bunch of function pointers in it. And uh, those function pointers will include callbacks into the bridge driver to let it uh, return bridge information or perform control space reads or writes or M maps or data space reads or writes or a control write message, which is a, a packet I haven't really talked about, but it's, it's used to talk to other management entities out, uh, out on, the, on the fabric. And then of course there's an unregister which corresponds. Up in that upper block, uh, blue block in the block diagram, uh, for a native device registration, we'll, we'll have uh, a Gen Z register driver function, very much like the PCI uh, version. In fact, I think it has identical parameter interface. Uh, the main difference between uh, device driver registration for Gen Z versus PCI is that in the PCI world, you have vendor and device IDs and in Gen Z, all the IDs are UUIDs instead. So the matching will be by uh, UUID. And again, there'll be a structure, Gen Z driver structure passed in, which has um, PCI-like probe, remove, suspend, resume kinds of uh, function pointers. And again, there's an unregister. 
And as I mentioned before, um, ZMMUs and IOMMU management is pretty fundamental to the way uh, Genity works. And so we want to centralize control uh, and management of those so that we don't have to have every driver doing the same thing. Um, so the subsystem will know about ZMMUs. It will have calls that will allow mapping control space or data space uh, ZMMU entries, control space in particular so that we can do um, an implementation of a SysFS interface to user space, which we'll talk about in a minute some more. Um, as I said, we work in progress here, so we don't know exactly what this API looks like. But to the extent possible, we're going to try to hide this difference between page grid and page table based CMMUs. I'm still not convinced that we can do that, but that's the goal. Um, because Gen Z can connect to an IOMMU in the system, and because PACES appear in the ZMMUs themselves, um, we're very interested in having some kind of common uh, set of calls that allow us to manage uh, PACES. And so you can see our first question about the community here in blue, which is should there be or can there be generic Linux uh, interfaces for managing PACES? And there was a talk earlier and, and, and some hallway conversations we've had since, which I think has convinced us that that is the direction that the kernel is heading, so good. <laughs> um, second question out of the community here is about huge pages. Um, it's our understanding that uh, huge pages for device memory are not well supported in the kernel today. And uh, there's a whole host of reasons printed on the slide here for why we think Gen Z really could uh, benefit from that. Um, first off, as I mentioned before, there's a huge number of components possible and each of them can have a huge data space. And if you're trying to match, uh, map all of those with 4K pages, uh, you're going to be sad. Um, so big pages help solve that problem, at least mitigate it. Um, especially in the page grid case, since there's so few uh, PTEs in, in the device, uh, they tend to have a huge range of page sizes available. Uh, the bridge I mentioned before supports everything from 4K to 256 terabyte pages. Um, so we'd like to be able to take advantage of that in, in the ZMMU. Um, and then the third question on this slide is uh, again about IOMMUs because um, we've seen patches posted uh, over the last year or so about uh, shared virtual addressing and making a common interface to IOMMUs. And again, we could very much take advantage of that in our subsystem um, because we can have a bridge, for example, that connects via CXL. And if CXL is implemented by uh, Intel and AMD and ARM CPUs, um, you can use that same bridge, but the IOMMUs in those, uh, sub in those platforms are different. We'd like to have a set of common calls that uh, we can make to manage those IOMMUs from the subsystem. I mentioned data movers earlier in the block diagram for a bridge. Um, we're a bit torn here. Kernel drivers like uh, block or uh, emulated Ethernet NIC drivers would greatly benefit from having a generic data mover interface so that we could write the code once um, and uh, call into, s into the subsystem where it could then have interfaces to the underlying bridge driver. Um, and um, that would also be uh, useful in being able to generate packet types uh, in uh, Gen Z that are hard to do with load store like atomics or the right message, or some of the other more exotic ones like buffer and pattern requests. Uh, on the other hand, RDMA drivers, which in the end want to expose the, the queues and the, and the data mover hardware directly to user space, are going to have to have user space drivers that hide the, the uh, differences between those queue mechanisms. And so they are not particularly interested in having a common uh, data mover interface. So 
question to the community again is, do we think we should work on that or not? Interrupts and unsolicited event packets are uh, kind of different in the Gen Z space. I'll describe unsolicited event packets here in a minute, but interrupts themselves are very different. Uh, unlike in PCI where there's a very nice architected MSI, MSIX interrupt structure and uh, you can have common code in the kernel that knows how to manage all of those things and common code that interact, intersects, interoperates with the, uh, the underlying um, interrupt chip and uh, similar structures in the kernel. Um, that's not how it works in Gen Z. Every device can have interrupts, but there's no common mechanism for describing them or programming them, so it has to be done on a per driver basis. Not unlike what was described by Intel in uh, the SIOV talk yesterday. Um, so maybe we can leverage something from what they're doing. I don't, I don't know yet. Um, Interrupts can come from different places in Gen Z. There are packets that let you send interrupts across the fabric from one OS instance to another or from any component to any other component that can, uh, can take an interrupt packet. So that's one source. Um, interrupts can come from the bridge when the data mover has a completion queue that entry that's done or uh, some incoming packet comes into the, the receive data mover that will want to generate interrupts. And then there are these things called UEPs, unsolicited event packets which are the Gen Z mechanism for a single component, uh, some component in the fabric to signal kind of fabric state changes like links up and down or hot add and remove of components or errors. And so uh, we need to have mechanisms to pass those interrupts up into user space if there are user space managers that are, that are handling that. And uh, our proposal uh, is that those UEPs become local interrupts on the, on the targeted bridge component. And those are handled by the subsystem and then forwarded to the user space by uh, some mechanism, um, perhaps Netlink, which we'll talk about here uh, some more in a minute. Okay, that's kind of the end of our kernel subsystem part of this. I wanna talk about the user space pieces and uh, what the kernel subsystem is presenting to user space um, to make uh, user space managing components work better. So as I hinted at earlier, Gen Z discovery is rather different than the way say PCI does it, which is all in the kernel and you just explore the PCI uh, hierarchy and <coughs> you assume that all your devices are local and uh, owned by the OS. So here, um, every node uh, running an OS instance on the Gen Z fabric needs to run a copy of, of LAMAS, the local management services process. And um, LAMAS is gonna use Redfish, as I mentioned before, to go and talk to the fabric manager and find out which resources are owned by this OS instance. And when it has one of those resources, it's going to make a Netlink call uh, into the kernel uh, Gen Z subsystem and say, add this component. And that's going to cause the subsystem to create new entries in sys devices uh, under this path that you see here. And you'll see, uh, you'll see that more on a further slide. Um, to cause that resource to appear uh, under a subnet ID and component ID uh, or a given fabric. And um, once the subsystem creates those slash sys devices, then uh, through the usual UDEV mechanism, um, that will cause uh, a search for a binder, a uh, driver that can bind to a particular UUID that was uh, added as part of that add component command. And uh, we'll get a, a driver bound to that. Fabric manager node is completely different. Um, the fabric manager is the, is the thing that needs to go out and explore the entire fabric and try to figure out what's actually there. And if you have a grand plan, as I mentioned before, 
does the grand plan match up with what we actually discovered out there? So it needs to discover those interfaces. It needs to find switches and bridges and media controllers and all the things that are out there. And um, the mechanism we're proposing that it used to do that um, is, uh, again, netlink, uh, add fabric component command, which will, again will cause um, new sysfs tree entries to be added under sysbus gen z for the sys devices. And um, once those sysfs entries are there, then the fabric manager can uh, open uh, the files that it finds in those sysfs trees uh, in order to get uh, direct read-write access to the uh, control space structures, uh, like I mentioned in the, in the introductory slide. Yep. So, um, does this mean if your uh, if your boot device is uh, out on uh, out somewhere in the Gen Z uh, fabric, uh, you will need to bring up Lana's uh, in order to boot. Or is that so so boot is an interesting thing. So just like in um, in a local fa in a local machine PCI in, uh, environment today, um, in order to boot from some unknown PCI device that's on your machine, you need to have uh, UEFI drivers, they assume you're using the UEFI environment um, that corresponds to that device. Um, that will be true here in, um, in a Gen Z fabric as well. Uh, UEFI will have to be modified. It's going to yes, have a new subsystem. Yeah. But once the, uh, once the kernel and init ramfs have been loaded, is, is we're going to need to have llamas in the init ramfs to Yes, you're going to need to have llamas in the init yep. ramfs. Okay. Yes, that is the implication of this design. All right, see, let's see where we were. Okay, I think we were about on the last bullet here, which is that, um, uh, another question here. So Netlink seemed to us to be a pretty good communication mechanism, uh, both to inform the kernel of add device, uh, add and delete uh, component and resource uh, commands because it has this uh, structure that lets you audit the, the kind of data that's going through. But it's also a bi-directional communication mechanism and so we can send UEPs and other interrupt events back to user space uh, using Netlink as well. And so the question to the community is, is that a good choice? Uh, we had a hallway conversation yesterday with What's your name, Jason? Jason, Jason kind of Mr. DMA, RDMA, uh, who suggested that they chose IO control for its performance benefit over Netlink. Um, I don't know that this is, has such stringent uh, performance goals as RDMA does, but uh, maybe that's something to think about in, instead of Netlink, I don't know. Although I don't know how to use IO control in front of a kernel to user space mechanism. So here is a very high level, very simplified version of what you might see in sys devices on a managed node. Uh, remember that six node uh, simple topology that I showed. Uh, in this example, we have um, the assumption that just a single one of those media controllers, uh, which has been um, assigned subnet ID zero and component ID two, uh, has been assigned to this node. So Lamas has run at this point and done its add command. It's told us that this uh, CID exists. And in, in slash sys, you'll see uh, a handful of um, properties like the component class and the free UUID, which I didn't tell you about. So if you don't know what that is, the GCID. And then two memory resources. So we assume that uh, two regions of that memory component number two have been assigned to this OS and this see um, control and data space regions control com, uh, correspond to those memory regions uh, as the resources here. Uh, there's a symlink 
from bridge zero that points to its actual native device. In this case, we're assuming on the right-hand side that this bridge device is connected by PCI. So that's first part of that hierarchy is a completely standard PCI uh, representation of the device in, in sys devices. And then attached to that bridge device, we'll, we'll create a Gen Z hierarchy. And in there, we'll have um, sysfs directories and uh, binary attribute files corresponding to the control space structures that are visible to that uh, local bridge. In contrast on the fabric manager, of course, if it's running Lamas as well, because it's, uh, it's locally managed and has uh, Gen Z devices, then under sys devices on the fabric manager, you'll see a hierarchy, not unlike the one on the previous page, but the unique stuff uh, for slash sys on the fabric manager is all below sysbus gen z and uh, under a, a fabric zero hierarchy. Of course, if you have multiple bridges, you might be connected to multiple fabrics, so that's why there's this fabric zero, fabric one, uh, fabric n uh, in the path here. Again, the uh, space ID and CID subdirectories. And then for each of the devices, out in the fabric that have been discovered, you'll see the control space uh, structures that will allow Zephyr to come in and uh, do open some of those binary attribute files and uh, do reads and writes to cause uh, control space changes or uh, read the parameters out of the devices and do the uh, fabric management that it needs to do. And the next blue question for the community here is, does this SysFS hierarchy look like something sane to you? Uh, is it consistent with uh, Linux's intended usage of SysFS? Um, one thing that worries me a bit is that because in the limit you could have 256 million components out on a fabric, um, that's a whole pile of SysFS files and directories. I mean, like more than has probably ever been in SysFS before. So are we going to run into some kind of uh, limitations in the sysfs subsystem uh, just by having so much stuff? Now, realistically, of course, probably won't have a single fabric manager managing a fabric that big. You'll do some kind of federated thing and divide it up, and there's a whole bunch of uh, stuff in the uh, system and management spec for Gen Z that describes how you can do all of that. So maybe it's not as bad as I may make it out, but in the limit, it seems like seems like a lot of sysfs stuff. Okay, that just about ends our talk. This is the place where we would normally in a talk have uh, you guys asking me questions. But before we get to that, um, for those who want to look at this uh, afterwards, um, we've summarized that set of uh, kernel questions that were in blue on the earlier slide, so you don't have to go searching for them if you don't want to. We have them all right here. And finally, I have some references. So. Uh, the consortium web page will let you get uh, access to all the specifications that I mentioned. They're all public. Uh, there are, of course, newer versions coming out that aren't public yet, but they'll be out there soon. Um, our code is on GitHub, uh, Linux-Gen-Z, at least an early version of the code. We're working hard to get it a little more sane, so don't look at it today. <laughs> Give us a couple of days and we'll have, we'll have more of this uh, actually up there. Um, Lamas has two uh, GitHub uh, repos because Lamas itself is uh, sorry. Uh, it's just on my screen here. What's it going at? Um, Lamas itself is uh, is one repo, but it, it's using a, a homegrown um, Netlink interface uh, called Alpaca as well. The thing which you do not see on this list is Zephyr, and that's because we haven't started work on that. But it will show up here as well. All right, and that's all I have. Anybody have questions? Go ahead there. Yeah, so I see Python 3 and uh, I'm a bit worried. So some environments, they have very little memory, like for example, uh, key dump. 
crash kernel, you basically reserve just a bit of memory and you want it to be like real small because you basically never use this memory. So what if we boot from uh, Gen Z attached disk, uh, kernel crashed and uh, we need to dump uh, our memory to the disk. Uh, so you mentioned that you still have to have llamas uh, in uh, init RD and uh, I'm just worrying that it will take too much uh, disk space. Good point. So, so is it, the question is, is it possible to implement like very minimalistic, uh, I don't know, llama Gen Z discovery so you can uh, place it in kernel? Because if you make it, you know, very complex, like, I don't know, Corba, it will basically die. No one will be using it. Understood. So first, our, our, um, I think you should consider this first implementation of llamas to be more of a prototype than anything else. We're doing it in Python because it's easy. It doesn't have to be in Python. It could be in C or C++ or Go or whatever you like, Ruby. Um, and second, um, for something like a crash kernel, if you are willing to pre-configure things, um, for example, in a static file, there's nothing that says that Llamas actually has to go out over the network and talk to the, yeah, that's uh, fine. To the um, actual fabric manager. It could have a local configuration file that, that is uh, uh, so kind of a proxy for that. So system, uh, do discovery, uh, have some, I don't know, pre-configured uh, configuration uh, that you can <coughs> apply in your crash uh, kernel when it kicks in. Yeah, I think and, that would uh, you won't have all this stuff in the uh, target then or most of it, okay, thank you. Oh, there is another question, uh oh. Perhaps a little heretical, but um, it, given you're building a system that has access to devices all over, um, would we be looking at why bother with some existing technologies? Uh, the, the thing that struck me directly was, well, RDMA is to do, talk to that device way over there through a direct connection or what looks like a direct connection. Would you be looking at saying, well, we don't need RDMA anymore, so why bother asking the question about RDMA on the slides? Um, so Hence heretical question. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Um, kind of a philosophical thing. If you were to take Gen Z to its logical extreme where we're trying to, to provide direct load store access to all those things out there, then I would say yes, RDMA is not necessary in that, in that world. However, um, there's a huge body of um, HPC codes in particular that are based on MPI and with Fabric and RDMA underneath. And we don't want to just throw that all away. And so, so Gen Z, in some sense, isn't better than any one of those technologies that, I, that, you, that you might mention. It's, it's not better than PCI necessarily. Um, it's not better than InfiniBand necessarily. It's not better than CXL necessarily. But it does do a lot of stuff. And uh, we want to bring in um, and not leave behind legacy codes. So I think RDMA is, is an important use case. And so I think it needs to live um, on top of the Gen Z subsystem for a long time. Comments, questions? 